Check this out. Some researchers took elementary school kids, broke them into three groups, and told them each one had to run a 50-yard dash and be timed. The first group, as each child crossed the finish line, the researcher just visibly clicked the stopwatch but didn't say anything. With the second group of kids, when a child crossed the finish line, the researcher clicked the stopwatch but then praised the child. The third group, the researcher clicked the stopwatch, praised the child just as much, but then added a helpful hint about more effective running. Then they had all the kids run the 50-yard dash again. Which group do you think improved? Well, the group that just had the stopwatch click silently, they ran about exactly the same time. The group that received praise and a helpful hint how to run better ran worse. The only group that did better was the one that just received praise. So apparently, human beings hear helpful hints as criticism. And then they remember the criticism, not the praise. Does that sound familiar at all? So you see, I worry that when you come to church, you hear my sermon as a bunch of helpful hints <laughs> for how to live your life. And if you hear it as helpful hints on how to lead your life, you might hear that as a criticism that you're not leading a wonderful life. And all you would remember is the criticism. I worry that that will happen at church. Because even though we praise each other as God's children all the time, we'll make some theologically accurate statements like we're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. Theologically accurate, but it can sound like a criticism, huh? Now, in a church like this, we talk a lot about how God loves you. God loves you. But I have to tell you, I barely hear that anymore. It's like a theological hallmark card, just a platitude. I, I, I barely hear it. It just goes right by me. First of all, by definition, of course, I think God loves everyone. The creator of the universe would have unconditional love, sure. But, but you see, if you think God loves you, even if you're a screw-up, it ends up you just remember you're a screw-up, right? So I... I don't think God loves you is going to cut it anymore. I, last week, I was in a class with a biblical scholar who said that the words at the baptism, you are my child, my beloved, with thee I am well pleased, God's words at Jesus' baptism, is actually better rendered in the Greek as I am delighted in you. And Psalm 18 says that God is delighted in you. Could you believe that? See, I think that has more punch than God loves you. You delight God. Oh, if I could believe that. I mean, every day I cross the finish line, right? I've ended my day, but I never really think I've measured up. I could have been better. I could have done more. But that God is just delighted You delight God. Could you believe that? I want to try to believe that. Will you bow with me? Creator of all things, creator of reality itself, help us to know you delight in each one of us. If that's hard to believe, may we draw close to Jesus whose simple loving presence will open our eyes. Help us to draw closer to one another, our brothers and sisters. Help us to take delight in one another, all in His name. Amen. So,
what are the very first words Jesus ever spoke? What are the first recorded words of the Lord of the universe? According to the Gospel of John, these are the first words spoken by Jesus. Are you ready? Wait for it. What are you looking for? Did you see it? That's the first words of Jesus in this gospel. What are you looking for? I love that. You would think the first words of the Christ might be some sort of doctrinal proclamation. Uh, some sort of pronouncement. But instead of expounding some theological truth, he's inquisitive. What are you looking for? It's always better to be inquisitive first with all those around you before you start to expound. First be curious. I love that these are his first words what are you looking for? Oh, I love the vibration of that. You know, so it's so existential, isn't it? I mean, it gets right to it. All week long, I've been wondering, what am I looking for? I mean, that's existential. What are you looking for? I don't mean just the Netflix series you're going to binge next, right? Or or a better UNL football season. I mean, what are you looking for? In 1987, U2 came out with the Joshua Tree, and that was the first year I was starting seminary. Bono, The Edge, Adam Clayton, they took the first words of Jesus. Most people probably didn't know that, but they're taking the first words of Jesus and they worked it into a rock and roll song that Rolling Stone calls one of the top 100 songs of all time. Rolling Stone probably doesn't know those are the first words of Jesus, basically. And when Bono sang those words, it was gripping to me. I was just starting seminary. I wasn't sure what I was looking for. Can you hear it? Um, Ariel is sort of our Bono here at First Plymouth, so… Yeah, yeah. Uh. (laughs) So, so do do you you remember it? It, What's the refrain? But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Let's join them. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Do it again. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. All right, all right. Okay, remember that. I'm going to have you do that more later, okay? You've got it now. Oh, that gets right to it. What are you looking for? Let's get into the text. I've told you what the first words of Jesus were, but in the Gospel of John, let's look at now His first appearance before He speaks. Did you notice in the Gospel of John, there's no birth story. This is the first moment He appears, and He's just walking by twice. He's a passerby. Did you see that? We're in the second sequence. Twice, Jesus just walks by. And John the Baptist is with two of his disciples, and John the Baptist says, that dude's the one. Now, the King James Version, the KJV, says, behold, the Lamb of God. But in the JKV, the Jim Keck Version, it's, that dude's the one. We don't have John the Baptist with us, but would you notice when Jesus is walking by on your own? I imagine many times in your life, he's walking along. Would you even know?
John says, this is the one. And the two disciples with him start to follow Jesus. And this is where he speaks his first words, first recorded words, what are you looking for? Did you notice how they answered? They didn't answer it. They totally deflect the question because it's a hard question. I bet they don't know what they're really looking for. They still haven't found what they're looking for. And so they totally deflect that. Do you see this? He says, what are you looking for? And they go, uh, enough about me. Where are you staying? Right? But here's Jesus. Oh, <laughs> here is Jesus. He says what he would have said anyway. He says what he was wanting to say. He says, come and see. He's not referring just to where he's staying. That's what he wanted to tell them. You see, this is what good religion would do. Good religion wouldn't try to argue you into some belief. Good religion isn't going to expound and try to, try to somehow polemically convince you that this is the right religion. A good religion would just say, come and see. See for yourself. You don't have to accept this on anybody's authority. Just come and see for yourself what this way of life is like. See, this is what good religion would do. Discover for yourself that when you love neighbor, when you love yourself, and you love God, come and see that type of life. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. See, bad religion will seize upon that anxiety. Bad religion will grab that anxiety and say, we've got a secret. We'll tell you what to look for. We've got secret knowledge. This is what bad religion do. It'll jump on that anxiety and say it has an answer, a secret. My friends, Jesus Christ is not a secret. There's no secret knowledge. We're all novices when it comes to God. But when a bad religion starts acting like, you can come in and be an insider. We've got some secrets. Trying to seize that feeling because we all have that feeling. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah, bad religion, it'll jump on that, and then it'll try to convince you you want to be an insider. Get in on the secret, right? And so bad religion will create these insiders and outsiders. I hate that distinction between insiders and outsiders. But your very concept of religion, you've let this be implanted in your brain. Your very concept of religion is you're either in it or you're not. That's not a religion of Jesus Christ. That's our category of what a religion is. You're an insider or an outsider, and I hate that distinction. That is an ornery, surly distinction that rips us apart. A religion of Jesus Christ wouldn't seek to do that to create insiders and outsiders. It has to blow up your whole concept of religion. Jesus Christ in the Gospels is trying to blow up that basic crass distinction between insiders and outsiders. In the Gospels, the people you think are the insiders become the outsiders, and the outsiders become the insiders. He says the first will be last and the last will be first. He's like blowing it all up. I hate that distinction. When I was a sophomore in high school, oh, this insider-outsider distinction. When I was a sophomore, I moved into a new town, so I didn't know anybody at the high school. You know what that can feel like? I didn't know anyone. And I was 16, and the first class I had to take was Espanol, and my voice was changing. I didn't know anyone. And my voice was changing, and the way that class started, my very first class, was the teacher would ask you, como estas? And you had to say, muy bien, gracias, y tú. But my voice was changing. I'm a new kid in school. 
And I would say, muy bien, gracias, y tú? <laughs> and the kids would laugh, and I felt like an outsider. You know, as those next couple years went on, I got really involved in the sports and became friends with people and sports and music. And, and by the end of high school, I felt like an insider, but it occurred to me, if you feel like an insider, it means there's still outsiders. And that sucks. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That feeling we have that we're not sure what we're looking for, that never goes away. It, it actually is what propels us on this walk. It, that feeling never goes away, but Jesus comes alongside. Jesus comes alongside. You'll never feel like you reach some perfect destination in life. That's not life. That's not faith. But Jesus comes alongside. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Could you believe that God is just delighted in you? However it's going for you right now, whatever this infinite quest we feel we're all on, that God is just delighted in you, even if you don't exactly know where you're going. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Near the end of that song, Bono starts to preach. I don't know if you remember the end of that song, but he starts saying, I believe in the kingdom come, then all the colors will bleed into one, bleed into one, right? You remember this song? He starts to preach, but yes, I'm still running. You have broken the bonds. You have loosed the chains. You have broken the bonds. You have loosed the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. Do you remember how much he's preaching at the end of this song? You have carried the cross of my shame. You know I believe it. He, he believes, but he still hasn't found what he's looking for. Belief isn't all the answers. Belief is walking along with Christ. It's not all the answers. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I haven't still found what note I was supposed to start on that thing, but you kept shifting with me, and that's good. That's good. See, together, together, we're on the infinite quest, but we're not alone. Jesus walks alongside. We have one another. We have our God. Amen.